Hey music junkies, Professor of Rock here with our latest edition of Pop Fix, where we focus on the greatest artists and the greatest songs of all time. Please subscribe below and join our community of music celebration. I want to introduce you to an anniversary segment that we'll be featuring for the next year where we celebrate the year 1990. Much like we celebrate 1985, we're going to do 1990. We're recovering every number one hit from that year. We're also going to include commentary from some of the artists, writers, and producers who helped create and craft these classic songs. I'm also going to highlight some top 10 hits from that year that even though they didn't make it to the top spot, were highly influential to our culture and worth discussing. We start with four that went to number one and one that got close. Here we go. Robert Van Winkle, otherwise known as Vanilla Ice, became the first rap artist to top the Billboard Hot 100 on November 5th, 1990, when his song Ice Ice Baby overtook Janet Jackson's Black Cat. Ice Ice Baby caused a controversy that still rages to this day when he used a sample of the Queen and David Bowie song Under Pressure, though Ice would jokingly deny that it was the same. In an interview he did with me, he talked about discovering his song from his brother. You know, when I was going through the records of my brother, I saw that Queen record, man, and I just, I was like, man, this group is funky, and they rock, and every single song is just so much passion bleeding through that record. And I, and I, I found this one that they did, David Bowie. Yeah. With David Bowie? Yeah. Wait, I gotta hear this. As Soon as that riff came in, ding, 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 I was hooked. And I was just like, oh my God. And I, so I had this SB1200 drum machine and we were just looping this stuff with my, my yeah. DJ, Earthquake. So magical, man. And then, and then it all just came together in 20 minutes, I wrote that song. You can watch the entire mini documentary on Ice Ice Baby and its inspiration with Vanilla Ice himself right now at our Professor of Rock Vivo channel. Just click on the link in our description below. Now, whether you're a fan of this song or not, no one can deny its influence on our culture, then or now. With Ice Ice Baby, Vanilla Ice wrote lyrics that have really become part of our everyday lives. I mean, for example, whenever anyone says, all right, stop, your mind immediately goes to collaborate and listen. I can think of a few more. Rolling in my 5.0, which was later used in an Adam Sandler movie. Also, if there was a problem, yo, I'll solve it. Yo, VIP, let's kick it. And even though it was said for a long time before, Vanilla Ice brought the phrase, word to your mother, to the globe. I'll say this. When I was in eighth grade, I may or may not have tried to shave lines in my eyebrows to mimic Vanilla. And I may or may not have shaved off my entire eyebrow. True story. I have to say though, Vanilla Ice, he's a good dude. I was really impressed with how gracious he was to his fans. And let's be honest, Ice Ice Baby brought new attention to the Queen Bowie classic, Under Pressure, and introduced it to a new generation because of the sample. You have to remember that Under Pressure was not a big hit in the United States. It stalled at number 29 in 1982. When Sinead O'Connor was discovered by Nigel Grange and Chris Hill of Enzyme Records, they said the band she was performing with was, and I quote, horrible, awful songs, awful playing, but the singer was interesting. This little student type with her baggy jersey and torn jeans just singing to her feet for three quarters of an hour with this amazing voice, singing to her feet. So Sinead O'Connor may have been one of the first shoegazers. Eh. Grange and Hill wanted to change her look. Sinead said they wanted her to wear high heel boots and tight jeans and grow her hair. So Sinead did what she's pretty much known for. To quote, she said, I decided that they were so pathetic that I shaved my head so there couldn't be any further discussion. Sinead O'Connor was managed by Faulkner O'Kelly, who was also her lover. I mention that for two reasons. One, O'Kelly was the one who suggested that O'Connor record a Prince song entitled Nothing Compares to You. Prince had written and composed it for his side project, The Family. He later did a live version with Rosie Gaines. Sinead O'Connor recorded it, and then two days before she filmed the iconic video, she had a very dramatic breakup with her manager. As a result, 
She later said that her tears flowed easily while the cameras were rolling, going from sadness to anger. The song went to number one on April 21st, 1990 and stayed there for four weeks. From there, Sinead O'Connor has taken her passion and fury many ways, with public battles with everybody from the Pope to Frank Sinatra, as well as Prince himself. She said that Prince left her stranded at 5.30 in the morning without a ride. Prince denied this incident, but the power of the song is emotionally palpable. It's been covered by many, including a moving rendition by Chris Cornell, but the original is unparalleled. I guess you could say nothing compares to it. When screenwriter John Fusco was writing the Western Young Guns, he found inspiration from Bon Jovi's top 10 hit, Wanted Dead or Alive. Though at the time, Fusco was listening to a lot of period music like old banjo and bluegrass. When he heard Wanted Dead or Alive on the radio, it gave him a boost of energy. And like millions of other people, like you and me, he went right out and bought Slippery When Wet. When it came time to do Young Guns 2, lead actor Emilio Estevez told Fusco that Bon Jovi was a big fan of the film. And then Fusco imparted that his song had inspired the films. Emilio then went and told Bon Jovi, who had just happened to read the script for Young Guns 2, and was working on a song that was inspired by it. Anyway, John Bon Jovi visited the set in New Mexico, and he wandered on with an old beat-up guitar, and though it was freezing that night, Emilio Estevez, John Fusco, and John Bon Jovi went into a trailer, and Bon Jovi gave him a private performance of a song that he'd written called Blaze of Glory. Though he initially had some doubts about a rock song in a Western, John Fusco went with the song, playing it at the end credits. The song was a smash, peaking at number one on September 8th, 1990. It won the Golden Globe, and it was nominated for an Oscar. Fusco also decided to put John Bon Jovi in the film. Check it out. <laughs> Janet Jackson was unstoppable in 1990. With her second straight pop album masterpiece, Rhythm Nation 1814, she became only the third artist or band in history to have seven top 10 hits on one record. Bruce Springsteen and her brother Michael being the other two, but here's the thing. Janet is the only artist in the history of this planet to have all seven go to the top five. Bruce and MJ didn't even do that. With Escapade, the third single from the album, Janet had her third number one and second from the record. Janet apparently loves basketball. She's a big Lakers fan. She would tell legendary producing writing team Jimmy Jam and Terry Lewis that at games that she had been attending, they were playing one of her favorite songs ever, Martha and the Vandellas' classic Nowhere to Run. Here's what Jimmy Jam told me about this in our interview. The idea with Escapade was really that Janet wanted to have a song that got played at basketball games. She said, I just want something with that kind of energy, the way that there are certain songs that always would get played. And um, there was a lot of influences on that. There's always a Motown influence um, on a lot of Janet songs because for us, melodically, we think her voice has a lot in common with Diana Ross in the sense that it's a voice that you want to sing along with. Janet recorded her own version, and because of the flawless production, her iconic and distinct voice and charisma, Escapade is a pop manifesto. So great that it didn't matter that the song's title and main part of the chorus, the word Escapade, wasn't really part of the vernacular at that time. Janet took it to the top of the charts, as she would do many times after. You know, what makes Janet Jackson so legendary, so incredible, is her ability to bring an overall theme and a deeper meaning to her incomparable hooks and extremely catchy melodies. She did it with control and she improved on it, in my opinion, with Rhythm Nation 1814. Partly inspired by Marvin Gaye's What's Going On, Janet knew that an album or a song could change the world. Here's what she would say at the time, and I quote, I just want my music and my dance to catch the audience's attention just long enough for them to listen to the lyrics and what they're saying. Depeche Mode released a masterpiece of their own in 1990 with the lush and satisfyingly dark album Violator. 
the foursome placed their first top 10 hit from that record with the song Enjoy the Silence. Enjoy the Silence is not only one of Depeche Mode's greatest songs, it was a major hallmark for new wave music as it entered into the 90s, which went from being called new wave music to being called college rock, and then it was modern rock, ending with the catch-all term used now alternative music. The song's immaculate and lavish yet brutal musical territory is emblazoned with lyrics of darkness and savagery. On the surface, Enjoy the Silence is a different type of love song, as lead singer David Gahan sings of being unable to form loving relationships with anyone and insists on silence, hence the lyrics, words are meaningless and forgettable, crashing into his little world, causing him intense pain, where he has no alternative but to seek silence and chooses to be alone in his only form of happiness. It's pretty much the introvert's national anthem. Now, the Anton Corbin music video references the storyline of the renowned children's book, The Little Prince, also an influence on Morrissey. David Gahan is dressed as a king, wandering over the hills of the Scottish Highlands, Portugal, and the Swiss Alps with a deck chair. Black and white footage of the members of DM posing in leather. I'll just say this. The posing clips are so amazingly cool. The boys of fast fashion gave Elvis Presley a run for his money. Seriously, go right now and compare the coolest picture of the Beatles that you can find. Put it side by side with a black and white steel from the Depeche Mode video and tell me who exudes more cool, more angst. That year I went from shaving my eyebrows off trying to mimic Vanilla Ice to buying my first leather jacket and growing out my curly hair to mimic David Gahan and Martin Gore. Trust me, I'm going to be doing a segment on Depeche Mode very soon. This is just a warm-up. Anyway, there you have it. All the songs I've just mentioned, along with the other number one hits from 1990, including Prince and Chris Cornell's covers of Nothing Compares to You, are included in the curated Spotify playlist below in the description. So go check that out. Also, leave us a comment about your favorites from 1990, about the artists that we've just mentioned in this first installment, and please subscribe and share this channel to help us grow this community of music celebration. Until next time, three chords and the truth, my friends.